Okay, so what I want to do uh, before we get into the next packet is just to look a little bit at what I call the cyclic learning method, okay? So this doesn't really apply to the, the packet I'm going to do in a moment because it's more introductory material, but if I just look ahead to the next one, and if you look online, I've probably published this already or put it up there. The next packet after the one we're going to talk about in a moment is the components of matter. And for every packet from that point forward, we're going to have a header which has a reading assignment and a homework assignment. Okay? This is very, very important. This, this is kind of setting us up to kind of be successful. Okay? So how it works is you download the packet. Okay, hopefully you have, you know, the one we're going to go through today and sitting in front of you, Y chemistry, okay? That's the one we're going to talk about in a moment. Okay, but remember that one doesn't have the header, okay? So how does this cyclic learning work? Well, you download that packet, okay, and you do the reading assignment, okay? Do the reading assignment. This sets you up for success when you actually watch the video and actually do the work, okay? So completing the video and filling the note packet in as you go is very important. That's where the learning happens. But to be successful, you've got to kind of have an idea where we're going, okay? So you do the reading first, okay? Then, we fill out the packet together, so to speak. If we're in class, we'd fill out the packet together. You're going to fill in the packet as you watch me on the video. Remember, I'm going to kind of say, hey, you know, pause the video, try the question, and then you can just run it and see how I did it, okay? That's where learning happens. Learning happens when you actively solve problems. This is why the packets have lots of empty space, okay? You, you might think to yourself, wow, there's lots of empty space. Yeah, that's where you write answers. <laughs> that's where you learn chemistry, okay? So do your reading, set yourself up for success, learn the chemistry by filling out the packet and getting the answers right. And this is where we have a crucial, crucial situation here. And uh, many a time, you know, we have a nice lecture at school and uh, I hear the students leaving the room. Oh, I really understood what he was talking about. I, you know, I seem to get that material. That's danger because unless you go back and visit that, it won't set. I think of this a bit like wet cement, okay? So let me ask you a question. In all honesty, this is a question that's very simple that no one can answer. Ready? What did you have for dinner six days ago. That should be easy, right? What did you have for dinner six days ago? And no one can answer the question because memory fades exponentially. Okay, so if I do a little graph up here, this is time and this is how much information you retain, okay? And it falls off super quick, okay? Kind of looks like Britney Spears' career. That's a joke. <laughs> Okay, so we have an exponential decay, all right? So you can barely remember what you did yesterday, all right? So how are you supposed to remember this chemistry stuff? Well, it turns out if you use that information, and Einstein has a very famous quote, Einstein says, I can tell you 10 times, or I can show you once, or something to that effect, right? So if you use the information, if you solve homework problems right after you've learned the material, that's going to set the information. And if you go back to my, our graph up here, you've kind of brought it back up here and then it decays away more slowly. Okay. So this is where the learning is enforced with homework. Okay. So the quicker you do the homework after you've completed the packet, the better. And my best students follow the script. Okay. They come to class prepared, they do the reading, they're successful and understand the material when we fill out the packets and then they do the homework and that cement gets set. Okay. And then we just go around again with the next packet. All right, so look on the header for each packet, beginning with the next one for the reading and the homework assignments. Homework, of course, I don't collect, but the answers are in the back of the book. If you look elsewhere for your homework, make sure you have like answers, okay? And if you get a different answer, then hey, office hour time, okay? All right, so that's the cyclic learning pedagogy, to use a <laughs> teaching word, all right? And it really, really, really works, okay? If you can stick to the script, you'll pass this course no problem, but it does involve effort, okay? That's where people trip up in chemistry. They think, oh, business as usual, it's crammed the night before, regurgitate some facts. No, you've got to put the effort in. People who put the effort in pass easily, okay? So that's a little, little tip there, okay? Now, let's get into it. So, the first packet I always discuss in my, you know, my first or second lecture of the semester after the syllabus is a motivational piece. We talk about, you know, why are you here? Why are you taking chemistry? 
And for students coming straight from high school, this is often needed, <laughs> okay? However, I found that in the summer, we have returning students. Students have already contacted me, hey, I need this class to go into a big school, you know? So people are motivated. If you're coming back to take, you know, chemistry over the summer, you're motivated. You probably don't need to be motivated by me, right? Because you're here right now doing this. Okay, so I'm actually gonna skip forward a little bit, okay? I'm gonna get to, apologies if you printed this, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to get to this, okay? What is chemistry and what do chemists do? So, you know, in essence, you know, we're going to study chemistry for the next eight weeks. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> so it's a simple but kind of deceptively kind of substantial question, isn't it? Okay, so this is a great place to pause, right? So in your own words, describe what you think chemistry is. And then, or if you like, what does a chemist, you know, what's the job of a chemist, right? So put here what you think chemistry is. Okay, so pause it, write down what you think it is, and then I'll give you the quote unquote official definition in a moment. Okay, pause there. All right, are you back? So what I did was I cobbled together a bunch of different definitions from different textbooks and I came up with this, okay? So the, how I like to think about chemistry is this. Chemistry is the study of matter and I'll underline that word matter, right? And I'm English, right? So long sentences with commas and its properties. As we'll come on to later, there are two general properties of matter. There's physical and chemical properties. Okay, but for now, understand that, hey, matter and its properties is what chemists study. And particularly when you think of a reaction, you see change. Something changes color, a gas comes out. We're really interested in chemists in the changes that matter undergoes. And if you think about it, we call those reactions. All right. Now, I did a reaction just yesterday, actually. I cooked a burger, okay? And when I burnt the charcoal, the goal was not to make carbon dioxide. The goal was to make heat, okay? So associated with every change, if you like, or every reaction, there's energy or heat, okay? So we're not just interested in what we make, we're interested in how much heat comes out, or how much heat goes in as well. So we, we'll write that. So the changes that matter undergoes and the energy associated with those Changes. So I'll read it through one more time because my writing's terrible. <laughs> Something you probably already figured out. So chemistry is the study of matter and its properties. We'll get onto that in more detail later. There's two kinds of property. The changes that matter undergoes and the energy associated with those changes. Okay, so hopefully you had some of these key words up in your description. All right. Maybe you had more kind of uh, kind of jargony words like experiment for change, an element or compound or something for that's a different kind of matter, and things like that. Okay, or heat maybe for energy. All right. But that's uh, a nice simple definition of what chemistry actually is. Chemistry is fundamentally the study of matter and its properties, and the energy changes associated with that. Okay. Now moving forward. So. We had some key words there, and I'll make sure this is on the screen. All right. The most key word of all was matter. Okay. Now, if you ask for a kind of a street definition of matter, it would be stuff. Okay. So we all own stuff, right? So materials, things, physical objects. Physical objects are matter. All right. Okay. So anything with mass and volume is defined as being matter. All right, so if you like to think about that, mass is really weight and volume is really shape. So anything with mass, weight, and volume or shape is defined as being matter. Now chemistry is the study of matter, right? So if you think about it, that gives us an immensely big canvas to work on. Hmm. So if we made a list of everything that was matter, we'd be here forever. Right? It's a simpler question to think of anything that's not matter, and that's something chemists can't study. 
All right, so think about that for a second. Just give it a pause. Think about it for a second. What has no mass and what has no volume? I've got yeah, Katy Perry's brain. No, I'm joking. <laughs> think about it. Something without mass and without volume. Okay. All right, are you back? Things without mass and without volume. Well, people think, oh, outer space, right? Well, that has volume for sure. It's, it's in a big open space, but does it have any mass? Well, yeah. It turns out that if you remove all the matter from a container to make it like outer space, particles start to appear. Subatomic particles just appear out of nothing, okay? It's kind of weird quantum goo sort of stuff, right? But there's no such thing as a pure vacuum. So it can be very little about matter in a big amount of space, but it's still there. Okay, so there is no such thing as a pure vacuum. There is no such thing as nothing, it turns out. All right, so we can't think about a space as having no mass. It's very small. All right, some people say to me, oh, what about air? Well, do this. You can feel the molecules hitting your hand, right? So yeah, that's the mass of the molecules smashing into your hand, okay? Tornadoes wouldn't pick up cows and throw them at people if air didn't have mass, <laughs> okay? You knew that. All right, so you have to think a little bit more, hmm, out of the box a little bit, okay? So things without mass and volume. What about thoughts and ideas? How much does Christianity weigh? <laughs> You can't weigh an idea, right? You can't weigh a philosophy. So thoughts and ideas, not really the realm of a chemist, right? More a philosopher. Okay. What about energy? How much does a calorie weigh? You can't weigh a calorie, right? It's a unit of measurement. Okay. So we can measure energy changes, but we can't put some energy in a jar, come back tomorrow and measure it, you know, separately, so to speak. Okay. So it's kind of an associated property. All right. Finally, here's a clue. Yeah. Time. How much does a year weigh? All right. Again, we can use time in our experiments, but you know, technically it's not matter. So those are the things students have come up with over the years. If you can think of any new ones that don't have any mass or energy, put it in a discussion. I'll give you a point of extra credit. Okay. Now, so we're going to deal with this stuff called matter. So everything around us is made of matter and it doesn't matter what it is. Okay. Diamond, tree, the air. Okay. It's, it's all different forms of matter. Okay. So, but what are the basic building blocks? You kind of know this already, all right? It's atoms. Atoms are like nature's Legos. All right. Unfortunately, I don't have my periodic table handy. All right. Maybe I'll, uh, so I can find one. All right. Maybe put it in the video. Okay. There's about 119 different types of atoms as found in the periodic table. All right. That means, you know, it's like 119 different types of Legos. All right. So they're the, you know, they're classically these small, tiny spheres about, 0 0.1 nanometers, 0 0.1 billionth of a meter wide. Okay, so atoms are the smallest piece of stable matter. Smallest type stable matter. Now, ma nature is extremely diverse. There are literally billions of different types of matter out there. Okay. So how do we make those types of matter? Well, we'll get onto it in more detail in the next packet, but atoms of the same type stuck together are elements. Atoms of different types stuck together in a fixed ratio, like H2O, are compounds, right? Okay. And my analogy is this, it's a bit like making words from an alphabet. There are 26 letters in the English alphabet, right? And from that, you can probably make about 250,000 valid combinations called words. Okay, so from an alphabet of 26 characters, I can make 250 valid combinations. All right, nature's alphabet is 119 characters. It's all the atoms in nature, all the different types, right? Periodic table. Think of all the different permutations of 119 characters in an alphabet. There'd be literally billions of words you could make. And that's why nature is so diverse. We have so many different atoms to choose from and to combine to make different combinations we call compounds. Okay. So an atom is the smallest piece of matter. Think of it like a Lego. There's lots to play with. There's 119 types, stick them together to make
make elements and compounds. Elements, same kind of atoms stuck together, compounds, different atoms in a fixed ratio. All right, now, <clears throat> where does the word atom come from? Good question, right? It's actually Greek. If anybody knows Greek, okay, it makes sense. Okay, now back in the day, I think this was Democritus, right? So one of the Greek philosophers had a thought experiment. So all experiments back in the day were thought experiments, right? Philosophy. And it went a bit like this. So like, go back in your mind and think about it. So take a piece of matter. In your mind's eye, take a piece of matter and cut it in half. All right? And then take the half you've got, cut it in half again. And then just keep going and pretend you've got perfect vision. You can see the tiniest of details all the way down to super, super tiny. And the question was, can I keep going forever? Is the matter divisible forever? Or do I get to a point where it can't be cut in half anymore? If you said you get to a point where you can't cut it in half anymore, you're right. Because what actually happens is you get to a point where you make something that's two atoms big, right? You cut it in half and you've got one atom. Can you cut an atom in half and have half an atom? The answer is no, because it wouldn't be stable, all right? So that's uncuttable. The atom is basically uncuttable. And the uncuttable, as a word in Greek, is atomos. Okay, so Greek word for uncuttable is atomos, the uncuttable atom. Okay, so the smallest stable piece of matter is uncuttable. You can't cut it in half anymore. Atomos in Greek, hence the word atoms. All right, now here's an interesting thing. Can you ever see an atom? All right, well, it's a complicated story. The answer is yes and no. Okay, so if I try to look at an atom with a microscope, something, you know, 300 magnification, the best optical microscope we could take a look at from biology, right? Okay, you'd probably see something a couple of hundred atoms wide as the smallest thing you'd ever see, right? Okay, why can't you see atoms with a microscope? Doesn't matter how big the magnification of the microscope is, you never see atoms, all right? And it all comes down to size, okay? So here is a light wave, all right? So, it's probably, you know, red light, 540 nanometers wavelength between peak and peak and trough and trough, right? Okay, and that's what we see with, we see with light, right? It goes in our eye and signals, etc. right? Okay, now, for matter to interact with an object, it must be of a similar size, okay? So, if I've got 540 nanometers between here and here, Minimal size I can see is about an object of about 540 nanometers. But remember, an atom is 0.1 of a nanometer wide. There's no way the atom will be interacting with that wave. A nice analogy, if you remember a movie called The Perfect Storm with hunky George Clooney, right? Okay. There was a Gloucester, Massachusetts fishing boat, and it went out, and three storms combined to make the perfect storm. And the cover of the, the movie DVD box has this big wave just about to crush this tiny ship, right? Why was the uh, boat crushed by the giant wave? Because the wave just didn't see the boat, it just washed over it, right? If that was an aircraft carrier, it wouldn't be affected because it's much bigger, all right? But the tiny fishing boat and the giant wave, the wave didn't even see it and didn't interact with it, just washed over it, all right? And destroyed it, okay? Same kind of thing with atoms and light. Light waves just wash over single atoms, okay? You can't see them, all right? Now, you may be asking yourself a question, but wait a minute, there's something called an electron microscope. That's true. If you take an electron beam and you put a lot of energy into it, you can make the wave shorter. And maybe you can see things maybe a hundred atoms wide with an electron microscope, okay? So yeah, you, but you're not using light, you're using electrons, all right? So, Still, an electron microscope will not image a single atom. That's not possible with any microscope that, result, that needs waves, all right? So how do we get around that problem? Well, interesting. This, well, I should say it's an image. These are images down here of actual individual atoms. How on earth did science solve this problem? Well, it's kind of neat, okay, and it all comes back to this very, very simple idea. Ask yourself a question. How does an old school record player work? 
Okay. Well, you have that vinyl disc, right? Good Trivial Pursuit question. How many grooves on a record? Uh, two. <laughs> one on the front, one on the back. They're just like a snail shell, right? Okay. And what do you do? If you look in here in the groove, you've got like a, a trench with little bumps in the bottom, right? Okay. And what you do, you put your needle in the record, and then the record rotates and the needle moves. And when it hits a bump, it gets deflected. Okay, now in an old style gramophone, it moves a magnet, vibrates and sound comes out here. So you, you translate geographical information to sound information. That's an awesome concept, right? What Binning and Ruhr, the inventors of this machine, so-called scanning tunneling microscope, STM, what they did was they just miniaturized the whole thing. So they got an atomically flat surface and they froze some big bulbous atoms, probably some xenon or something on the surface, right? And then they got an atomically sharp tip. All right. Now, what's on the outside of an atom? Well, electrons, right? So if you like, the outside of every piece of matter is negatively charged, right? Negatives repel. So when you bring this tip over the top, it kind of rides over the bump in the road. It deflects up, just like our gramophone tip. Okay, and you can actually tell where the atoms are on the surface. Fantastic, right? Okay, so you can image. It's not a picture because there's no kind of pictures below the wavelength of light. It's like a map, it's like a geography map. We call them STM, Scanning Tunneling Microscope Images. All right, fantastic, right? But then you're saying, well, what the heck happened here? I've got the IBM logo, one, two, three, four, five atoms high. These are actual atoms, right? Now, these didn't get there by themselves, right? The atoms don't have shares in IBM, <laughs> right? Okay, someone put them there. And this is the genesis of nanotechnology. What you can do, you can get your tip, move it down a little bit, and then literally, after you figured out where the atoms are, you can kick them around the, the surface like a soccer player. Kind of neat, right? Kind of neat. All right, and you can put them in any position you want. There's a logo for IBM. This is all this original work was done at IBM in Alameda, California. If you do a search for STM IBM, you'll see some neat images like this. These are atoms in a circle and a kind of a cylinder, and then that's the surface they're sitting on. Remember, the surface itself is made of atoms. All right, so that's how STM works. We can now image atoms, and that was literally an instant Nobel Prize back in 1984 for the inventors of the uh, STM, Binning and Rohr. And actually, they were, you know, notified of their Nobel Prize at half time in a soccer game, believe it or not. The person came running on the pitch with a big bouquet of flowers. Congratulations, you just won the Nobel Prize. Yeah, all right, neat. Now, <clears throat> next thing, real quick, just got a few minutes left here. Water. What's water made from? Let me move that down, sorry. What's water made from? And how do you know? Well, water has what's called a molecular formula, right? Everyone knows the formula of water is H2O, right? What does that actually mean? It means I took an H, I took an H, and I took an O. I took those three atoms, I stuck them together, and I made this new thing. I stuck my three Legos together. All right, there we go. So that's my water molecule. Fair enough, right? Okay, now if I looked at a water molecule with an STM, I wouldn't see that. That's a classic picture you sometimes see in a book, right? It would actually look kind of like a jelly bean because once these things are stuck together, it's like sticking Legos together forever, right? So super glued Legos, right? Look like little jelly beans, yeah? Okay, and then the question is, well, if I've got one drop of water, how many jelly beans are in there? Okay, this goes to the point that molecules are real small, right? Okay, so I want you to think about that for a minute. I want you to think about how, how many molecules do you think are in a drop of water? It's going to be a big number, right? So tell me when to stop. Anybody think there's a thousand? Hopefully not. Million? Billion? Trillion, there's your economic stimulus. Thousand trillion. Billion trillion. Three, six, nine, twelve, fifteen, eighteen zeros. Twenty-one zeros. That's a crazy big number, right? So 
A molecule is called a microscopic object, all right? A drop of water, something you can see basically in your hand, is a macroscopic. But the size scale is immense, right? I mean, it's try and get this number in perspective, right? So thousand, million, billion. That's like the population of the planet Earth there, right? Thousand, million, billion. That's another population of the planet Earth. And then a thousand of those. So it's a thousand times the planet Earth population times the planet Earth population. Imagine that for a moment, right? So imagine a thousand people. Maybe you've seen a thousand people this week. <laughs> Could you not that out, right? You've seen a thousand people this week, and each one of them is holding the planet Earth in their hands. So you've got a thousand billion, right? I'm not done. I've still got to do another planet Earth multiplier, right? So a thousand people holding the planet Earth. Everybody on the thousand planet Earth is holding a planet Earth in their hand. That's a thousand billion billion, okay? That's how many molecules are in one darn drop. <laughs> Crazy. All right. Next thing, we're nearly at the end here, okay. Again, just to round off, what do chemists actually do, okay? What's the fundamental goal of every time you go to the lab, right? You go to the lab, you do some work, right? What's the point? Why do you do an experiment, okay? And then think about how chemists express their findings, all right? so. Pause there, I'll come back in a second. Oh, you're back. So, basically, what do chemists do? Chemists explain macroscopic phenomena. Something like the burning of charcoal, which we'll talk about in a moment. Maybe the freezing of water. So big stuff, stuff you can see with your eye, right? That's macroscopic. We call those experiments in chemistry, right? So if something changes in front of you, you can see it. It's macroscopic. What do we do in terms of the repeated identical reactions of microscopic particles. Atoms, molecules, etc. Okay. So move that out so you can see. So in essence that's what chemistry is folks, okay? Chemistry or what chemists try to do, every time we do an experiment we have to explain what happened in the test tube, right? So chemists explain what happened in the test tube, the macroscopic, in terms of the repeated identical reactions of microscopic particles. If I go back a page, if I wanted to make a drop of water, I'll take a hydrogen atom, take a hydrogen atom, take an oxygen, stick them all together to make a molecule, and then I'll just repeat that a thousand billion billion times, and I'll be done. It's a long day at work, right? The good news is it's the same every time, so we don't have to write it all the time, right? We just write it one time and say repeat a lot, <laughs> okay? So, let's look at that real quick. So whenever you see this um, picture, this is what all chemists look like when they retire. I'll come and see me in a few years, I'll look like this guy, <laughs> right? So when you see this, we're being chemists basically, right? So we're being chemists, we're comparing macroscopic and microscopic. All right, so real quick, so I've only got a minute left. All right, so oh, time's up. I'll actually finish this one real quick in a real brief follow up video. Okay, so hold tight. Okay, so we're back. <laughs> Probably gonna do like a two minute video. Okay, so. We can take our time a little bit, okay? So remember, chemists explain macroscopic phenomena such as the burning of wood, the freezing of water, anything that happens in a lab, anything that happens in a test tube, in terms of the repeated identical reactions of microscopic particles, which we'll go on to know as a chemical equation, okay? So it's always great to draw a picture, right? So if I'm burning some charcoal, so this is the charcoal on my grill, okay? So, you know, if I burn some charcoal on my grill, Make the brick a bit bigger. So each one of those, it's a tiny brick of charcoal, right? 
obviously the real brick would be much bigger. All right, so there's my tiny brick of charcoal, right? And we'll write what it is, that's solid carbon. Charcoal, it turns out, is solid carbon. All right, okay. Then I'm gonna react it, maybe you know this, things burn with oxygen gas, right? What is oxygen gas? Well, it's a, what's called a diatomic molecule, two oxygen atoms stuck together, all right, okay. Now, where's the action? Remember, this happens one atom or one molecule at a time, so let's just kind of put a little star next to that one. We don't really know what happens on the femtosecond scale when these things bump into each other, but this oxygen will bump into this carbon. These bonds will break, bonds will make, and what you'll be left with is a brick with one less carbon and our product. The carbon sits between them like that. Okay, turns into, you may know the formula of this thing, CO2, carbon dioxide. There we go. So that hopefully is not your first ever kind of pictorial representation of a chemical reaction. But remember, it's one atom at a time, right? Okay. And then we just repeat many times. So when we write these balanced equations, maybe you didn't think about this when you were writing these things. That particular carbon atom, we write C for carbon from the periodic table, right? And then S for solid, because it's in a solid piece of carbon, right? Plus, this is a gas, and it's two oxygen stuck together. G for gas, turns into CO2 gas. All right, hopefully that's not your first ever balanced chemical equation, but now you see where we're coming from as chemists. A balanced chemical equation is a one-time microscopic description of what happens. That just repeats many billions of times, right? To burn the charcoal, to freeze the water, whatever it is, okay? That's, that's how nature works, okay? We explain it one event at a time. It just repeats many, many times over. That one event at a time is called a balanced chemical equation. And that's fundamentally how chemists talk to each other. We talk in terms of balanced chemical equations. We're really saying, hey, what happened one time? Just repeat many times to get what's in the test tube. All right, so we'll stop there. That's on to the next one. <laughs>